right, listen. I appreciate that, man. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, I'm Philip H. Anselmo. Uh, I've been doing gigs since I was 13 years old. I joined the heavy metal band Pantera in 1987 until the uh, end of the band in 2001. Um, geez, damn. Uh, that was a ride, man, with Pantera, man. We, the first real heavy metal band uh, to come in number one on the Billboard charts. And I'm born and raised in New Orleans, and I take a lot of pride in that, you know what I'm saying? I've always spread that around the world, which I've been around the damn world a bunch of times. And uh, ah, that's enough about me. You know about me. And uh, I play right now in a band called Down. And uh, it's all New Orleans-based guys except for Rex from Texas. He's the original basis for uh, Pantera as well. Hmm, what else about me? Uh, <laughs> enough, man. Let's roll. And tell them some of your, um, your back history with um, drug abuse. Back history of drug abuse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is this scheduled for an hour or what? Uh, it is an hour. Six. You, you, All right. They'll probably stay late for you, so go ahead. Okay, well, there is no reason really, that I can point to. I am an extremist when it comes to everything. Anything I set my mind to, I'm an absolute extremist. I cannot say it any better. And I was injured. I had a back injury from, and I don't suggest anyone do this, but I would climb up on top of PA systems and dive head first either into the waiting crowd or into the waiting concrete, and it made no difference. I would attack. I would attack on stage, and I paid for it, Jack. I ultimately injured myself, and like putting a Band-Aid over cancer, when you rupture a disc in your back, it begins this thing called degenerative disc disease. So that means the next one's going. And then, then you know, obviously the next one after that, and then so on and so forth. Well, <clears throat> I think it was about the time when the record came in at number one, I was Pretty terrified. I was happy as hell. Don't get me wrong, man. I was like, oh my God, yes! And at that point, I had just got back from the doctor, my second MRI, and I realized I had two blown out discs. Now, in order for me to be this Superman that they, the media had built me up to be, I had to quell that pain. You understand me? So it started with, and I ain't laughing, man. It is, uh, you know, we can laugh together, but this ain't funny, really. I uh, started off with regular painkillers, which would be your hydrocodone-based painkillers, Loraset, Loratab, whatever and muscle relaxers. And I'll call one out for the evil that it is. There's one called Soma, which should be yanked off the goddamn market. Pardon me if I slip up with the uh, language sometime. I guess we're all adults and just remember, it's just words. I didn't invent them. So, uh, <laughs> eventually you climb up the painkiller ladder because painkillers lie to you. They will magnify that injury. And that's all that's on your mind. The injury and painkillers. Up the ladder I went, stronger painkillers, stronger painkillers, stronger painkillers, and you hear, and you damn well know 
when your audience is looking at you different, when your band members are looking at you different, you know, going, man, what is wrong with Phil? What is wrong with Phil? You get a little tired. You get weary of it. You feel like this 20-something-year-old, which I was, juggernaut, man. You want to leap out of your skin, but you can't anymore. You can't just hang out anymore because it hurts to hang out. Or you're too loaded. And once everyone starts laying this trip on you, that's when you close the door and the needle slides in, Jack. And from that point on, you are on your own. You're on a ride. And uh, I wouldn't suggest anyone in this room, I would never, I wouldn't suggest on my worst enemy this particular ride. So, that's where I was. That's my drug background. Uh, we can get into some specifics here sure. in a little bit, you know, but. Did you feel like the, the record label glorified the, you know, the drug Absolutely use? Absolutely not. Uh, normally a record company is out of the loop, the last to know. I don't need this. The last to know. But you they're, said they're, 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 they're mechanics. Right. They're mechanics. I'll tell you what happens though. When you're signed to a big record contract, which I don't even know if it really exists anymore today, the music system is so different. But back in the 90s, when you, got, when you had a record contract, you had publicists. You had oh, a million different tentacles and satellites that were doing work for you. But normally, a publicist is the one who pushes you, pushes you to have your face on the cover of these magazines. The Kurt Cobains, the Lane Staley's. Rest in peace, by the way. And me, destroyed, drug riddled, pathetic, yellow, right there on the cover of magazine and <laughs> you have no choice but to submit and be put under a microscope and hey it's a chapter of your life man it don't go away it don't go away and they will glorify you when you're on top of the world man they make you the media that is they will make you MTV magazines, VH1, yeah, it don't matter. They'll make you Superman. But once Superman stumbles, it's kind of like the old adage, man. Once your head gets, uh, once you get big enough for your head to see over that fence, that's when people start throwing rocks at it. Once Superman trips up, man, they will judge your talent, your accomplishments, and your trip ups, and solidify your entire life in one paragraph. And it hurts, Jack. <laughs> it hurts, because you know they don't know you. They don't really know you. They don't know the struggles. They don't know what it's like. Most writers and uh, media people are wannabe musicians anyway that can't do it. And that's the truth. So, so ask you another question. <laughs> <laughs> so do you still mistrust, you know, do you still mistrust the media? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because straight up, man, case in point. When Pantera was breaking up. Breaking up, man. I was a wounded animal. My will, which we'll get into later, will 
all of us have a will now, and we'll definitely get into that. But my will was defeated. I could be drugged one way or another. Started another band, side band, super joint ritual that turned into this other thing when Pantera was hanging, and then this media thing. A war of words via black and white sentences. You sit there and you read it. Now, basically, what happened was I did this particular interview with this cat. And on the way out, we're walking off the bus. He's behind me. And he's like, man, I hope this doesn't you know, get out of hand between you and Dimebag and Vinny. He goes, man, well, what would happen, man, if, if they jumped you or something like that? You know, got mad at me, jumped me. A very hypothetical thing. The way I speak. You know, and look, I, okay, I said something to the effect of, I'd kill those boys, you know? They can't fight me, you know? I'd kill them boys. You read that in black and white. I'd kill those boys. It is as literal as a mofo. It is literal, and they took it very literally. And the media ran with that, man. All over the world, man. In different languages, <laughs> you know. And at that point, there's no more. There's a rift. There is a rift. So yes, I don't trust the media at all, unless I have to sit there and really think of a concrete answer. You can't wear your emotions on your sleeve around the media. And I do wear my emotions on my sleeve big time. So beware. Do you feel like when all that started happening that like you turned more to heroin? And to like maybe get through the tough times or no way. I was already knee deep in heroin, man. <laughs> Neck deep in heroin, you know? That made no difference. It didn't make me turn any which way or another. If anything, it made me want to pick that phone up and go, wait a minute, dime bag, wait a minute, Vince. This is taking way out of hand, bro. But there was no answer at the other end of the phone. So And they weren't calling me either. So, you did. You speak a lot of this about will. That's right. Why don't you describe that to him? Like, what does it mean to you? What does will mean to me? Will is something we are all born with. And what will does for me today is everything from wake up, get out of that bed, take my fused disc, uh, three, to, what is it, triple fusion, I had three disc fused, and I have titanium screws and rods and stuff holding, you know, when they tell you, we're going to put six screws and this clamp in your back, you think maybe it's a neat job or some, something like that. I saw MRI, that thing, it looks like I have a nail bomb inside of my body. I mean, it's like six inch screws, it's like, my God. So you gotta get up every day and will yourself into stretching, keeping in shape, a workout schedule, eating breakfast, Working. Now, hey, man, that, that might be funny right now. But when you're on dope, which I'm sure we'll get into later, <laughs> breakfast don't come in uh, eggs and bacon. I'll put it that way. So everything, regiment, will, will, will pushes you. But will is incomplete without love. Love's a trippy word. I know that 
I remember being a whippersnapper like you, you, uh, <laughs> you folk out there, man. Hey, love, man. You can put love in many places, but put it this way. How many, uh, just a question, how many of y'all are lifers, serious musicians that want to actually do this for your life? Okay, good enough that I'm really talking to you at this point. The rest of you, you ain't got no choice but to listen, lest you run. There is a saying. that love is nothing more than a jack-o'-lantern. You know what a jack-o'-lantern is. You know that candle that flickers. But it does go out now. We don't know how long. Love is a jack-o'-lantern that hovers over graveyards and bogs. But if you take that love and attach it to will, it becomes a lighthouse that brings you safely into harbor every time. Study hard on that. Think about that. Ask another question now. <laughs> we'll get on. <laughs> so do you think it was Will that, you know, got you to stop picking up the needle or to stop using altogether? Ooh, that's a tough question right there. Okay. Once you close the door and slide that needle in, heroin is the great controller of all, of all, every single goddamn thing you do, the way you sleep, the way you wake up in the morning, and your hands reach over pathetically to get your first fix of the day, which gets you out of bed. Matter of fact, heroin in a nutshell when I say controls everything, I mean everything. People think painkillers and things like that are only numbing out pain. You take them for long enough. They start numbing out your emotion, man. And once your emotion is numbed out, then you are controlled, Jack. You're controlled. It's got you. It's the most important thing in your life, whether it be this tiny little pill or this funny dust. And you're trading your family your brothers, your sisters, the brothers and sisters you call friends on the street, lifelong friends, you'll stab them in the back. You'll stab them in the back, you'll break their hearts, and you won't even know it. So I wrote this, man. It might be terrible, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, shit like that happens. Okay, now this is me. Heroin. Here's your day. One forty one PM sharp. Wake up with things to do. This is living on the heroin cal calendar and schedule. Wake up with things to do and a bundle of 10 bags. That's 10 bags of heroin I'm talking about. Shoot two bags. Make love with that first rush of the day, Jack. Because before that, you wake up, your bones are freezing to death. Bam! Instant gratification. Huh. Smoke half a pack in bed. 
Make a phone call about replacing this rotted wood on the front porch frame. Smoke break. Not off. Eight bags left. Do two of them. This is all in one day now. I just woke up. Remember 141 sharp. No, I don't want to join your internet club. All right. <laughs> Eight bags left. Do two. Revel in temporary numbness. Smoke break. Call about getting the front porch screened in with locks. Two more bangs. Six bags left. Smoke. Not off. Miss the callbacks. Lay in bed. Smoke. Call about repainting the front porch. <laughs> this sucker ain't even fixed yet, you know? Call about repainting it. Office hours are closed. Leave an indecipherable message. Work done. Take a break. Stay in bed. Two more bangs. Four bags left. Smoke. Not off for an hour. Ignore the phone ringing. Wake up. Smoke. Bang two more bags. That means two bags left. Call someone about something, no answer. The clock reads 5 or 6 p.m. The sun gone from the sky. Shoot one bag. Neither so great nor definitive, meaning the high. You're like, man, that didn't feel enough. Do your last bag. Not off. Wake up with a vengeance. It's 7.55 p.m. Start making desperate phone calls for my next fix. Heroin at best, methadone at worst. And we'll get into methadone later. Wait. Chain smoke. Whimper. One pack of cigarettes left out of five. Tears begin to well up in your eyes. Smoke more. Regret. Just begin to sweat. Take your last three somas. Muscle relaxers. Lay in bed. Really sweating now. Take off all your clothes till you're naked. Then start to freeze. But continue to sweat. Take your last two and a half Xanax. I'd sit up Indian style, rock back and forth, crying harder now, and think about the Down syndrome similarity. Regret! Crash out. The phone rings like a thunderclap at 9.37 p.m. That clock is important to you. Don't think it ain't. Answer immediately. Score! Dope and smokes in an hour or so. Relief. But fear, fear always lingers till dope is in hand. If you don't know, stay in bed. Shake empty pill bottles. Paranoia. Mentally pace. Because you ain't getting out of bed. Thinking all the wrong things that can happen from there to here in dead silence. A fleeting moment of guilt. Living out the true blight of being wealthy enough to have suicide delivered upon request. No hitting the streets for me to cop. Irony. Trading one disaster for another. Not a light on in my house as usual. Just listening for a car door to slam. <sighs> Eyes fixed on the digital clock minute by blurry minute. Delivery at 3.17 in the a.m. Stay in bed because that is where I am always. 
$500 trade without conversation. Bang two bags. Not off. Not hearing whoever leave. Time to start the day. And that's it, bro. You're not getting high anymore. It's fear that controls you. One little thrill. Oh, I only do it a little. <laughs> That's a laugh, man. And it's not a fucking funny laugh. Pardon me. Because once you start chasing your own tail, meaning there's two points here, especially as a musician. Once you started something, a band, something that's from your heart, something that's organic from you. And I had, was lucky enough to have this success. I don't know about luck. I done broke my back for what I believed in. <coughs> Busted my head off. I bled from my music, man. But heroin, when I say it controls all, I wasn't singing anymore about levels of confidence and power and walk and, you know, and all these songs of positivity. I was singing about dope. It even comes out in your lyrics, man. It comes out in your music. You go back and listen to it, it's like, oh, my God. You lost yourself. Yep, you sure did. You chase your tail. It's fear. The junkie fears the sickness, the illness. Because dope sick ain't fun, bro. It ain't fun. <laughs> it's miserable. And the only thing that cleans it up and fixes it up is more dope. Unless you are genius enough, like I was, to start taking methadone. Once you start taking methadone, It's over for 90% of people. They live their lives to wake up at 9 a.m., go to the methadone clinic, get their dose, and go on about their lives. What happens when Katrina hits and then methadone clinics were closed? I'll tell you what happens. You go into the worst detox, crippling detox. I had a friend of mine who was thrown in jail during Katrina, and he was on whatever milligram. Doesn't matter how many milligrams you're on, you're on it. He had to detox in jail. He was so goddamn pathetic, they had to throw him in the hole by himself, take him out of the populace. The only way I can describe coming off of methadone is falling from a 50-story building every three minutes of your life. Every three minutes of your life is terrifying. That's why people can't come off. You get me? It's fear. You don't start playing music to get to dope or drugs or booze. You don't. You start playing music because you love it, man. Am I right? Huh? You bet your ass I'm right. You don't, you just don't do it, man. 
And it is there, baby. It's a plague. And I know you damn youngsters, boy, I tell you, man, each generation gets more extreme and more extreme. I don't fear you. I feel sorry for you, man. But it takes will, and it takes the overcomer. To give the bird finger to it and say, ah, I got a gig to play, bro. Because once you start chasing your tail, I'll end it like this. No matter how great you were, how great you are, who, uh, whatever you think. Don't matter what magazines say. It don't matter what your fans say. It matters what's going on with you. There's two points. High and sick. High and sick. What happens in between? Huh? Fucking zero. Pardon me. But zero, zero, unless you're out on the road like me, and you got to get up in front of 20,000 people and make a rollicking ass of yourself. and get judged in print your whole life. Microcosm in some crappy, glossy page metal magazine. That ain't no epitaph, bro. Huh. That ain't no epitaph, ladies and gents. No way. Next question. So how long have you been sober for? Okay, sober is a harsh word. All right, all right. <laughs> when, when hey, hey, let, me, let me explain that now. Let me explain that now. I can get more detailed with it. All right, we can get as detailed. Look, when's this, the, ain't, this ain't for the When's the last time man. you've picked up the needle? Okay, now that is a hardcore story. I was with a friend of mine. I was holding dope. This was 2002 or three. I'm not going to guess anymore, but somewhere around there. And this friend of mine, uh, we used to party back in the day, you know, shoot dope all the time. Ha, you know. This guy was a little bit of a follower, smart guy extremely talented. Anyway, I was holding. Me and him were together. We're speeding down the highway. A pitch dark highway in Louisiana somewhere on the way to a gig. And there's two guys driving up from. He tells me, man, I'd like to party tonight, you know. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, I said, you know, it's been a while, man. You know, you sure, you sure, you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. So, me being the medical genius I am back then, especially, I gave him what I call, like, a, pardon the expression, but a pussy shot. A little bit. Just a little touch. And... I injected him. I asked him, how you feeling, bro? He's like, good, man. Someone up front asked me a question. Just like that, that quick. I turned around, I answered, I turned back around. This dude was stiff. His eyes were closed and his lips were like, like that, tight. And I said, hey, I called his name several times. No answer. Boom. I'm freaking out. I grabbed this dude and he is as rigid as 
rigor mortis. And I'm grabbing him and I'm shaking him and I'm shaking him and I'm pulling his beard and I'm slapping his face. And I grab the ice cooler and I reach down his damn pants. I'm putting ice down his pants. My friend, who I've known since I was 16 years old, is overdosing. There's no damn hospital speeding down the back roads of Louisiana. I'm looking around. I freak. I'm freaking. I don't know where to tell these guys to drive. And my friend is died. He's dead. I freaked out. And I reared back, and I went, boom, right in his chest. Boom, his eyes popped open. One pupil was looking this way, the other one this way. Kind of like the actor Marty Feldman. <laughs> and I was scared, man. He wasn't back yet, man. He looked crazy. I was thinking brain damage, retardation. I didn't know what was going on. I hit him again. Boom! And his eyes went, right back together. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa man, whoa. And I'm like, oh, my God. I stayed awake with him all night long. He was sleeping. Kept trying to doze off. Probably still loaded. Boom, I'd kick him. We got back to my house. I laid him out on my sofa. We stayed up till the sun came up. I stayed up with him. Wouldn't let him go to sleep. And this whole time, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I just killed my best friend and brought him back to life. Nope, I ain't a saint. <laughs> I ain't no saint, man. Uh, I'm the king of the liars. I'm the king of deceit. It's what heroin makes you. It's what dope makes you. Cocaine, heroin, whatever, they all go hand in hand. They're all in the same boat, and that boat sinks. It's got holes in it. And that was the last time I ever picked that damn needle up. That was the last time I did heroin. What are some of the lasting effects you think heroin has on you? Lasting effects? Yeah. Depends on the person. I still have friends that have been clean for longer than I have. They still have dreams about it. They, well, that's very common, too. Dreams about it. They go to certain parts of town, and they're like, Oh, man, that's right where I used to cop. That's, I used to go right down that alley and meet this guy or what I didn't tell the whole story. And it's constant. It's constantly in your brain, one, in one form or another. With me, I know it as enemy. I know it as enemy. That's why I'm here today, man, honestly. Because you can't fight heroin. But the only way to fight, I figure, is to wisen you people up now. Wisen you up. <laughs> And that's tough, man. 
Because when you're in your 20s, man, early 20s and shit like that, man, you will is aloof. You got one. Blockades come up. Because your will is your path. And all I suggest is you navigate slowly. Because life is going to test you anyway. And ain't none of us born with a silver spoon, really. It don't matter what walk of life you're from. Life is going to test you anyway. And point B is if you're going to go ahead and cripple yourself on dope, <coughs> number one, you're not going to be equipped to deal with life's test. Number two, you're either going to end up in jail or in the morgue. And I've seen it all. I've toured with hundreds of bands. I've seen hundreds of addictions. Pantera, oh, still, still, don't you, don't you even imagine this ain't true. And if you do, you better wake up and apologize. We were the hardest drinking band on the planet. Hands down. And I'll tell you what, if Dimebag were alive today, He'd be in some severe medical difficulty. Because Rex, the bass player, my bass player, drank himself so stupid, he's got pancreatitis now. He's 42 years old. 42 years old and pancreatitis. You know what that means? Huh? Anybody? That means if he takes a sip of a wine cooler, he has no idea if it's going to kill him or not. Kill him. And at one point, yep, he was acting just like a junkie. Hiding bottles. Hiding, hiding, hiding. Any of y'all watch that show, Intervention? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? It's entertaining, isn't it? Just watch other people, isn't it? Answer me, it's entertaining, right? Yeah. It's true. It's real. Rex was just like any alcoholic on that damn show. He lived in California, and I swear to you, the night the entire band was going to meet and have an intervention with my bass player, he had already done himself in, man. And at this point, I, look, man, I'm not going to talk about the negative after this because there is a positive side. This dude has probably spent over $100,000 on high-dollar, high-class <laughs> detox centers, medical help-me centers, you know? I'm an alcoholic. The first three times he went, I'm doing it for my kids. I'm doing it to save my marriage the next time. I'm doing it to get back in the band the third time. Guess what? <laughs> None of them worked. You know why? Huh? Does anybody know why? Didn't have will. You named it. You named it flannel. <laughs> Young flannel. 
You got to do it for yourself and you have got to want it for yourself. You can speak all the language you want because you'll hear it out of the attics. Oh, yeah, 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 man. Oh, I'm fine. Mommy, my mom's here. How many times did I tell you I'm fine? And I was full of shit. How many times? Hundreds? Thousands? <laughs> She's telling the truth. And since I talked about my mother, look, this is short and brief. But this is the truth. And I know y'all are at an age, everybody wants that independence, everybody's a grown up, everybody's a, a person. This is a, a simple question. It's not, I don't mean for it to be funny, but how and just get, I want to see the, the hands. How many of y'all are close with your mother and love your mother to death? Okay, that's good enough. I call this. The straw killed the camel. <clears throat> when your own mother has no choice but to walk away from the ghost of her only son, who still walks with his transparent, dullard tenant who has taken up residency in his vacant carcass, but over and again, to call her sadness. Sadness is an insult to her emotions. While I'm arrogant, aloof, insane, a liar, and completely blind, she in unison is trapped in private hell, made of me. The moment her back rests on her closed front door at the end of the day, of a work day, of any day, she begins sobbing. She prays for my very troubled soul in life. She cries her eyes out, day and night, remembering word for word the last thick tongue slurred, hateful phone call I'd made. Months? Let me see that. And damn, uh, I, I don't want to join your internet thing. All right, all right, let me see. Last hateful phone call I'd made months previously. It was the last time we had spoken. This is years ago. On that day, I told her spitefully that I would kill myself with heroin again. Over and over and over till she dropped the phone and ran out into her front lawn and threw herself on the ground and there she stayed, racking her brain over why and how her firstborn's love-filled nature ever came to be withered and dying on the barb when his young life should be in full bloom. When mom quit answering the phone and walked away from me, I wasn't calling anyhow. And that is the saddest part to that story. They'll walk away from you, man. Especially a mother like me. I don't mean a mother, but a mother Man, I like a son of a bitch like me. Strong headed. Mule headed. What are they gonna do? Tackle me? Nope. It was my decision. My decision. Right now, I'm going to. Yeah. <laughs> Just a quick recap on my bass player. He's been sober now for two years. 
two years he's been sober. He ain't got a clock. He ain't here. <laughs> <laughs> but he's been sober for two years, and I love him for it. <laughs> Next question. I was going to open it up to any of you guys if y'all would like to ask. Cough it up, okay. man. <laughs> any questions? Who's got questions? Raise your hand. I'll Just pick you up. Yeah. Go ahead, big brother. doing Pantera covers and stuff like that, that's fine. That's absolutely beautiful. Where you going? I mean, you got a pee pee. <laughs> Listen, man, it's flattering. It is absolutely flattering. I know we, I know Pantera invented a whole different style of heavy metal. We were, we took our influences and whatnot but for bands that cover, is that what you're saying, cover? Yeah. That's fine. That's a, I take that, I say, go for it, little brothers and sisters. And that leads me just to a quick thing. There's a question asked a long time ago. Hey, man, what's it, what's it take to be big musicians, you know? What, what, what do I got to do? What do I got to do? I'm in a band. Well, the difference between a decade ago and today. A decade ago, bands used to take their favorite 10 bands and rip them off to all hell. Rip them off. But within those 10 bands, you're going to find your own style. Today, <laughs> of course, I won't name any bands, but today it sounds like most people, most kids, most bands listen to their favorite two bands and rip them off all the hell. That don't work. That's regurgitation. And I think that's kind of where the state of music is, for the most part, for heavy metal, for extreme music, right now. Questions? Same vibes. The original. Yeah, the original. And like Evil Dead, the Exorcist, Chains, et cetera, et cetera. Is there any, like, is there anybody today that's doing horror films, in your opinion, like the way they should be done, like a true vibe, that the cast is real, like, no. alive, or don't be afraid of the horror? No. 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 I, I honestly, I think films have gone to hell, just like music. Very bland. <laughs> No, I'm not, I'm not gonna say they don't make good movies. I thought the orphanage was interesting, but it's still not Mario Bava's Black Sabbath. It's not Mario Bava's anything. It's not a film with Barbara Steele in it. No, atmosphere, you know. Honestly, it's the writer's strike. <laughs> in Hollywood. That's why we're seeing all the, these awful remakes. Last House on the Left, Black Christmas, I could go down. The Wicker Man, oh my God. <laughs> if anyone has seen the original film. Yeah. Huh. I know uh, Colin Yeo and uh, other people here. The original film, who said yeah? There you go. Okay. What are your feelings compared to the original to right now, to the new one with Nicolas Cage? Well, uh, the, uh, can you just say it in one word? Songs with movies. <laughs> just the songs with movies. 
Pardon me? <laughs> You mean the first one? The first, the first one, one had, no, it's many elements. I wouldn't even label it a horror film. No, it's all over the place. It's, it's all over the place. And that's what, that's another thing that makes a great film. When you can't really categorize it. Good call. Questions, man, make them harsh. <laughs> We're out of Go ahead, Gray Biggin. Downloading is killing music. It's killing music. Um, how do I feel about today's top bands? I feel that they've been extremely influenced by Pantera. <laughs> it's pretty damn obvious, wouldn't you think? You, you, does anybody else hear it? Maybe a little? <laughs> like, maybe a lot. <laughs> it's, it's flattering, but that's how things roll, you know. Bless them and best of luck. I know Lamb of God's doing good. Uh, you know, what else? Well, we're actually out of time, but if, can they, if you guys want to stay and ask him questions. Come on, <laughs> let's ask some questions. Go ahead there, Flannel. <laughs> Favorite musician. Uh, Pantera's not my favorite band. Musician. It's the band I'm in. One of my favorite musicians is a man called Donovan Punch. He played in a band called Soylent Green a long time ago. But he's on his own trip now, man. And he's one of the greatest guitar players I've ever seen. See y'all later, man. <laughs> See y'all later, man. I love y'all. Don't think I don't.